Idea Gen 2020, I'd like to welcome Kate Johnson, president of Microsoft US, the $40 billion, 7,000 person sales subsidiary of Microsoft in the United States. Kate also sits on Microsoft's CEO Inclusion Council, aimed at increasing the level of diversity across Microsoft. Having led change programs across several Fortune 100 companies throughout her career, Kate is particularly passionate about the role that people and the culture that supports them play in any transformation program. Kate is with us today to share her leadership journey and insights in helping Microsoft in their culture as she hits her third year with the company. Kate Johnson, welcome. Thanks so much, George, it's great to be here. What an absolutely incredible moment in time to be having this discussion. It's an incredible pleasure to have you with us today. And I know that our global audience is equally enthused as I am. Uh, we're glad you could join us during this unique time, truly, in history, and testing our resiliency with a new format and setting. In many ways, we cannot escape the discussion that is before us, which is this global pandemic. For sure. And it has forced us to seriously adjust in every aspect of our personal and professional lives. Kate, how are you adapting to this new way of working and do you have any advice you could share with us? Yeah, so, you know, it's a huge change for everybody, for all of us. Uh, no person is left untouched in this. Uh, for me, you know, we went from an empty nest um, to a house full of uh, children and dogs. And, um, you know, I've got aging parents on the East Coast that I can't visit because of the pandemic. So it's challenging. And um, I am finding some silver linings. I love spending the time with my, with my kids. Um, as a family, I think a lot of people are experiencing that same joy. Uh, but my biggest challenge is really figuring this whole work from home thing out. Am I actually working from home, George, or am I sleeping at work? I just can't figure it out. <laughs> but uh, the big learning for all of us is this notion of empathy. Everybody's got their own situation. And, um, you know, we need to be empathetic to that. And uh, they might not be telling you what they're going through. So you always have to have that in mind. That's absolutely right. And I think we can all relate in some way. I mean, you've been at Microsoft for three years now. It's a relatively short time, but you've made such a global impact already, Kate. What drew you to, drew you to Microsoft and what appealed to you about the company? Well, so I've had a career where I've had the opportunity to work for a bunch of different companies and doing lots of different jobs. I've been in sales and operations and uh, technology um, and services as well. And the common thread across all those roles, sort of looking back, is change leadership. And the opportunity at Microsoft presented itself. And here we have the CEO, Satya Nadella, who's got this crystal clear mission to empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. Um, but he's more importantly creating the conditions for true transformation of the company. It starts with the mission and, and we're lucky to have one that's so aligned with lofty goals, right? I mean, I think they're perfectly in line with the UN's goals about innovation and change. We're, we're trying to solve uh, problems of people and planet. So that's pretty cool. But we're also understanding that all change starts with people. It's really not about the technology. And that recognition is helping us create the conditions to drive true transformation for our company as well as the marketplace. And what change lover would pass up that opportunity? I just couldn't. Well, that's certainly an incredible perspective. And certainly the trajectory that you've had is, is simply remarkable. It does seem that Microsoft has got some momentum in the change game. We're seeing this response in the market, press, employee interactions. Why is that? And what is Satya doing that's different other than clearly articulating a lofty mission? Well, that's a great question. I think, uh, you know, while everything is anchored in this mission, it's the recognition that we had to be just as precise about the culture change that we wanted to drive. 
And uh, Satya sort of took his leadership team and spent a lot of time making sure that he defined exactly what our cultural aspirations truly were. It starts with having a growth mindset for everything that we do. It's about moving from being the know-it-alls to the learn-it-alls. That's very different. That's embedding yourself in curiosity and having the courage and vulnerability to show up not knowing the answer all the time. The second piece is we want to become obsessed with customer problems and solving them rather than being obsessed with our own products and services. We want to operate as one team. We call it one Microsoft. So it's melting down all the silos between the product teams, melting down the silos between engineering and services and sales and operations so that we can work together to obsess collectively about our customers' challenges. And it's creating a diverse and inclusive environment, one in which we represent the markets into which we want to sell and where we create uh, an inclusive environment so that we can truly harness the brain power of every human being that shows up for work at Microsoft. And all of that resting upon our value system, which is based in respect, accountability, and integrity. Now, those are very, very clear attributes of a culture and one in which a change leader like me can kind of anchor herself in to say, OK, let's make that real in our business. Well, again, Kate, it's truly remarkable in terms of the impact that you're having. And in just three short years at Microsoft, my gosh, it's it's quite simply remarkable. So how do you, you as a leader, how do you as a leader make that real? and then? How did you start to make the culture change that Satya talks about real inside within the business? Well, George, it's still really an ongoing process. I honestly thought it would be faster. Um, but after sort of staggering a little bit and, and not getting quite the momentum that I wanted in the first year, I had to find that critical breakthrough. And that breakthrough for me was a listening tour that I set up. I had a moment of frustration where I just said, okay, clear the calendar, let's stop, let's get out and talk to our people about what's really happening. And I set up about 60 one-to-ones at all levels across all roles in the US business to listen, uh, to get close to what our people were actually experiencing, to find out whether the messages of transformation were really getting down to them and if they understood what their role was in it. And the truth is, um, the messages weren't getting down and they weren't clear about it. Um, we were lacking simplicity and clarity about what our priorities were. We were lacking that short list of the things that we just all had to collectively do with great precision. Um, we didn't necessarily have uh, the rhythms of business set up in a way that was clear where we would repeat um, all of the messages so that people could really start to digest and understand them. And um, we didn't have culture called out in our, our scorecards for our business. We weren't actually measuring our people. And that's what I learned when I, when I went out and listened to our people. And so we came back uh, and made a lot of changes. We set out and put together a short list of priorities that we wanted everybody to focus on. We gave our people permission to actually ignore the noise in the system and just really focus on those priorities with great precision. That was incredibly empowering for them because in a very large company that's matrixed, it can sometimes be difficult to figure out what you're supposed to be focusing on. Uh, and the other thing is we, we went and actually called out culture in our scorecard. So how do you do that? You say, let's look at all the things. Are you building a diverse team? Are you inclusive? What's the feedback uh, from all the different listening systems that we have in terms of your performance and how you're received across the company? These were things that were incredibly important for us to set up the conditions to drive the change that Satya has outlined. And so I guess the key question as follow up to that is, is as a leader at Microsoft, of Microsoft, how easy was it to instill this culture change to get your leadership team on board, and of course your employees. Well, the funny story about that is it wasn't that easy to get the party started. Um, that listening tour was an important moment, but there was another moment where I got the leadership team on board and I wanted us to experience something together. 
Another leader at Microsoft, Chris Capicella, had taken his leadership team to Montgomery, Alabama to do an immersion tour in learning about the history of race in the United States. And I thought it just sounded like a wonderful thing to do together, particularly since it really hit on one of the core cultural attributes that we were trying or aspiring um, to be, which is diverse. So I took the leadership team to Montgomery, Alabama with sort of very little expectation about what the two days would be like. And I have to tell you, it was an incredibly powerful experience. Um, we met with Brian Stevenson, who is uh, a famed uh, empathic leader who's uh, written the book, Just Mercy, spent his entire career building the Equal Justice Initiative and has really rewritten the rule of law in the United States of America, uh, focusing on protecting the underserved. And I asked Brian a question, I said, hey, we want to become a more empathic organization. How do we do that at scale? And he said, look, it's a formula. Driving empathy and putting it into action is really based on four key components. Number one, proximity. You have to be close to the problems that you're trying to solve if you stand a chance at understanding them. The second thing is you have to be a great storyteller. You have to focus on narrative. Once you get close to something and understand it, be able to come back and evangelize and tell the story of why that thing is important. But the third step is you have to, you have to drive hope. You have to be hopeful in your narrative so that you can list people to sign up and get excited to follow. And the last thing is you have to be action oriented. In fact, you have to drive action even in the face of adversity. Proximity, narrative, hope, and action. Those are the four pieces of a formula for putting empathy into action. We were incredibly inspired by Brian's formula and thought, gosh, this is just directly applicable to everything we're trying to do from a culture transformation perspective at Microsoft. And if we could actually build an organization that sells and services software for our customers that was truly empathic, then we stand a better chance at A, understanding our employees better, B, serving our customers better, and C, probably activating the ecosystem of partners in a more impactful way. So together we flew home just in a completely different mindset, closer together as a team, understanding what we wanted to go do. We wanted to try and drive empathy at scale in the United States at Microsoft. Kate, I've got to tell you, it, it's it's awe inspiring and and simply breathtaking to hear what you just described with a formula for that key component of eth empathy driving into the culture at Microsoft. So, how on earth can you get seven thousand people <laughs> in an organization to change, especially with something? as soft, if you may, as empathy? So that's a great question because I'm not even sure I understood really what empathy means. So you gotta get help. You gotta ask the experts. And we brought in thought leaders that people were inspired by, you know, Brene Brown and, and Carol, and of course, Brian Stevenson. And we, the number one rule is we kept it simple. And we said it a million times. I used to have a boss uh, in sales a long time ago that said, hey, when you're trying to enable a sales force, all you have to do is say it a million times, and then you know you only have to say it one more time before they listen. Right. So it's just never-ending repetition of you know simple but impactful um, narrative around what you're trying to do. And then you got to pick your bets. you got to pick the things that you're going to focus on. I picked empathy because it's key to having a growth mindset. You just can't really be um, a learner if you don't know how to get close to something and dive in and you know feel it yourself. Um, it's key to diversity, it's key to inclusion, and I think it's key to being a high-performing team. So that's my bet. I picked, hey, if we draw, drive empathy at scale, um, we're going to have something special here. Um, you got to communicate constantly, right? Say it a million times. You need a system for that. And for me, I call it the repeater system. How do I actually structure the team to take the message and repeat it consistently down through the layers of, um, you know, 
a traditional uh, corporate organization. You got to have it in every format, digital, in-person, email, voice, um, you know, all of those mediums are media are incredibly important because people hear things in different ways. And then you have to make it a part of your performance management system. I talked about actually making it a part of our scorecard. Then you have to open up and have real conversations about whether or not you're making progress. You got to be vulnerable. You got to say, hey, I made a mistake and this is what that mistake looks like. And this is how I'm going to do it differently in the future. You got to model that for your people. And you have to have leaders who aren't afraid to do the same for you. And then finally, you have to use the moments that matter in the company. And for us, it started with a trip to Montgomery, Alabama, but that was just the first step. The second step was, you know, I'd taken the leadership team to go experience that. I needed to take that experience to the masses. So I invited Brian Stevenson to come speak at our annual sales kickoff. We had 8,500 people in the audience. He talked about putting empathy and scale and all of his experiences of, of um, you know, driving a change in the rule of law and bringing, uh, you know, sort of the focus on race uh, to the national level. And uh, two times during his presentation, he got an 8,500 person standing ovation. It was incredibly impactful. It was probably one of my favorite moments of my professional career to see the audience really starting to understand that. So bring that experience to the masses. But then we wanted to bring the masses to that experience as well, right? And Brian's movie was coming out in uh, January. So in September, right after the sales kickoff, we started to work on figuring out how to get the entire United States subsidiary of Microsoft to go to the movies together on the same day across all of the cities that we operate in. So we did a theater buyout, 42 different theaters. And at two o'clock local time across the country, every single person in the U.S. subsidiary was invited to watch Just Mercy together. That too was a really powerful moment. And so we had a leadership moment, then we brought that experience to the masses, then we brought the masses to the experience. And I guess what I'm trying to say is we made bold, visible moves that we're consistently emphasizing what we're trying to accomplish. And after the second, third, fourth kind of moment, people started to realize that, hey, she's really serious about this whole diversity and inclusion thing. We better pay attention. And you know, when you're bold and you're doing visible things, it's risky. You're gonna lose some people. But the question and really the name of the change game is do you gain more followers than you lose? And in this whole experience, that's exactly what's happened. We've really sort of developed a following of people who feel as passionate about trying to affect change of our culture as I do. And that's the exciting part. That's right. And, and it's, it, it, it's an incredible journey. And it sounds like this 7,000 person team plus plus now also own it because they've experienced it together collectively. For and sure. I would be remiss to not mention our late chairman emeritus, former Congressman Lewis Stokes, because after all, after all, I believe, and I know you do as well, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. That's right. And it takes that bold courage, statesmanship, and what Lou taught me, which was to work within the system to change the system. Right. That was his mantra, having spent 30 years in the United States Congress. And this is not a political issue, it's a humanity issue. So that's what I love about what you just described. And okay, Kate, so we're humming along here. It's the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. We're a decade from completing the sustainable development goals, those 17 broad goals of the United Nations, 3,500 odd some days to get there. And suddenly, boom, global pandemic hits. And the world sort of changed on all of us and for all of us. Right. Tell us, Kate, how you have had to change your strategy since being literally sheltered in place. What have you learned as a leader? And I guess the biggest question for me and for our audience today is, can you still drive culture change from your basement? <laughs> well, you may notice I'm actually in my basement. Um, so I'm, I'm sure it's not going to try, George. Um, but the reality is that... Uh, 
Um, empathy and the theme of putting empathy into action um, turned out to be a, a pretty cool place to, to place a bet. Um, it's incredibly relevant right now. And as I sort of started in our conversation, everybody's going through their, their own deal, their own situation. And we all have to be empathic, you know, and, and uh, provide empathy in our conversations because we just don't know what somebody's going through. Um, and when I think about the formula of putting empathy into action, there are those four pieces, proximity, narrative, hope, and, uh, and action. That first one, proximity. Well, most of us think of proximity as physical closeness. Being close to something means getting right up next to it. And the reality is proximity can just be so much more nuanced than that. It could be intellectual or emotional in nature, right? And I think when we were all sort of forced into our homes to shelter in place, um, we then all of a sudden, everybody's working virtually. How do you actually physically get close to somebody? You don't. But that doesn't mean you can't have proximity to them, to their situation, to your customers, your partners, your employees, and to all the problems and challenges that you're still trying to solve. You just have two core dimensions that you really have to work at. The first is time. We all work pretty fast. And the reality is, I think if you're actually going to create intellectual or emotional proximity, you're just going to have to slow down. And that's not in my nature. I'm kind of an impatient person. I like things to go fast. And slowing down to take the time to really engage. Everything can't be a two-second drive-by. I've got to actually be more patient and to kind of space out the meetings that I have with people to be deeper interactions because I can't get that physical proximity, which gives us sort of the signals that you're making progress. All of that's been taken away. So you've got to find that some other way. And I think it takes more time than it used to. The second piece is curiosity. We need to ask more questions than we answer. And people expect you to ask a couple as a, as a leader, but they don't expect you to fill an entire session with just questions and just immerse yourself in learning. And they tend to be quite refreshed when you do. So those are the two things that I'm learning as a leader in a virtual world can really make a difference and help me be proximate, help me drive the proximity that is so essential to creating empathy, is slowing down, taking the time you need, and, uh, and being more curious. Slowing down, uh, you know, that's such an interesting notion, especially as we're in the world appears to be moving faster and faster, especially uh, in this, you know, pandemic situation that we're in. There's certain elements that are that are just moving very quickly. And on that note, I've seen your CEO, Satya Nadella, mm -hmm. say that culture is something that everyone owns. And he doesn't want it to be Satya's thing, right? Obviously, he's got you on board as a critical leader on his leadership team. How do you make this systemic and something that everyone in your business can literally own? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, so a couple of things. Number one, I talked about harnessing the moments that matter and bringing the experiences to the masses and the masses to the experience. Well, the truth is everybody knows I'm a culture warrior. I am, I'm in it, but one person can't change an entire business. You just can't, you've got to have critical mass of people who understand what you're trying to accomplish. And um, that's why the leadership team is so critical. And then the extended leadership team is also equally as important because you got to get all the way down to the ground level. And in big organizations, it takes time, but it also takes people embedded in all layers of the company that really understand it. That's the first thing. Second thing is you just have to be consistent with your mission, your message, and your goals, and all of those things, you can't change it every quarter, every couple of weeks, every couple of months. I think that's the that's the mistake so many companies make. They want to keep it fresh and exciting. And the reality is nothing makes our people happier than saying, hey, we're actually going to keep the theme the same this year. We're just going to double down and really understand what it means. 
so that they can actually learn and grow in the context of that overall message and mission. Uh, the third thing is the communications. I talked about how important that is. Also, I need to be vis visible. My leadership team needs to be visible. The extended leadership team needs to be visible, really in it and owning the narrative. You can't delegate this thing. You just can't. Um, and then, you know, create examples and opportunities for people to see it. So we did this immersion offsite in Montgomery, Alabama. You know, learning together, you have to be vulnerable. If you don't know something and you're with coworkers who think, you know, you're supposed to be all smart, um, it can be anxiety uh, producing, right? Well, I wanted us to feel comfortable as a leadership team that we could learn in all sorts of different settings, not just Montgomery, Alabama. So the, the next day we did an immersion uh, session in Las Vegas. It was actually a quarter later. And we went to a school system and spent the entire day in the classroom with kids learning about underserved communities and the impact of the lack of technology in their world. And it was amazing. Education is an incredibly important topic in our U.S. market and one in which I really wanted everybody on the team to learn about. And how could Microsoft potentially solve some of those problems? That learning experience inspired a lot of our, our different initiatives that we created for the year and investments that we're making at the higher ed and K-12 through levels. Um, we then did an immersion day in the opioid crisis. Uh, that crisis is massive in its impact, especially in rural America. And um, we spent time learning about it and figuring out how we could actually be a part of the essential services delivered to those communities to get them better health care, better food, and, you know, fresh food services, um, and bring technology to their communities. Through all of these experiences, we learned together things that we didn't necessarily know that were happening right here in our own market. And that process has really enabled people to see, hey, if those guys can spend a day learning something and admit they don't know it all, I can too. It's been very impactful. And then we've had teams break off and create learning days where they go learn about their own markets and issues that they care deeply about. It's been incredibly impactful, but something that I think is that at scale motion is modeling it and then repeating it throughout the system. So that's kind of how we we think about, you know, sort of creating empathy at scale is it's got to be owned at all levels. It's got to be understood at all levels. It takes time, it takes repetition, great communication, and opportunities for people to show up in a new way completely. Kate, awe inspiring. You know, we've we've conducted hundreds, if not thousands, of interviews at IdeaGen over the years. And I've got to tell you, and I'm not a person to be at a loss for words, but today I've got to tell you that I am so incredibly inspired, really awe inspired by your replies, your insights, your leadership, because I believe what you described today in all of your answers for all these questions is truly leadership defined. Thank Kate, you. What, <laughs> it, it's fact and it's incredibly inspiring. What might our audience, where do we begin, but what might our audience take away from this experience today? Well, we've, we've talked about a bunch of different things. Um, I guess, you know, if the topic is all about innovation, how do you drive innovation? How do you drive change? How do you help companies take advantage of digital transformation? If you're only going to take a couple of things away as a leader of change, I would say, first and foremost, you got to be bold. You got to take on something big that will have lasting impact because change is too hard to focus and waste your time on the small stuff. Be bold, be big, make impact. I think the second thing is simplicity and clarity. Even though you're being bold, pick something simple um, and as connected to the human as, as possible so that people can really get their heads around it. And you gotta be clear um, in what you're trying to achieve and how you're gonna measure it. And then finally, communication is the key to everything. It's how teams come together, it's how we communicate with our customers, our employees, our partners. Um, it's the essence of keeping us connected. I mean, if you think about it, communication is how we're all staying connected in the virtual world. So harnessing the power of all the different communication channels 
and the simplicity and clarity of messaging inside of those processes is essential. Those would be the, the main takeaways that I'm trying to keep uh, you know, in touch with every day as I lead the organization through change. Kate Johnson, President, Microsoft US, changing the world, leading at Microsoft. For anyone looking to, to embark upon this journey of culture change, please be sure to follow Kate on LinkedIn and all of her social digital platforms. Incredible work changing the world. Kate Johnson, Leadership Defined, President, Microsoft US. Thank you. Thanks, George. See you soon. Thank you.